Hello and welcome to another English podcast with Paul. Well, thanks for joining me. Thanks for coming back. And those that are new, thank you for uh, for coming around and checking me out. See if there's some uh, interesting content or interesting conversation that you'd like to uh, join in and be part of the community. Okay, so today we want to talk about British engineering. British engineering. Now, bear with me. There is... Um, there is some upgrades I've made, not just to the, the camera, but also the microphone and the headphones. You know, invest a bit more money, show you guys that I'm committed and I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Haha, <laughs> quite literally. Pun intended. Pun intended. Okay, so yes, I've got a new microphone and headphones and things like that. And obviously you guys have seen this camera before. It's, it's uh, a very nice camera. All right, so British engineering, that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, if you bear with me just a moment, I want to take a quick peek at what I've got here in my notes. So I'll show you the screen on another camera um, and we'll have a look at what we've got there on, on the notes on that one. All right, let's have a look. All right, yeah, so starting at the top. This is the, I don't write a script, as you know, I just have notes and ideas and thoughts and ramble on quite a bit. So if you see me put my glasses on or reach down for some notes, then, you know, I'm being as professional as I can by giving you guys some interesting information, potentially factual as possible. But also, also, I want it to be natural and, and fluent and relaxed. You know, this is a conversation we're having here. That's that's what the whole channel is about. We're all having a conversation. Practice listening and speaking. And think of good, interesting and, and colourful words to use to, to make our language interesting. Interesting, exciting. There's, there's nothing worse than somebody with a monotone that talks the same all the way through and it just sounds like this and nothing happens in their voice. Well, my voice just went a little bit faster. But the best thing about listening to people on podcasts, for me, and Neil deGrasse Tyson is one of my favourite people to listen to, because he gets passionate and, and you hear his voice go up in pitch and the speed of his voice, the cadence, gets faster. And, and then the tonality when he's exclaiming something. It's all very, quite interesting to listen to. So he'll be like, oh my God. And you can hear the energy and enthusiasm in his voice. The guy is really passionate what he talks about and what he describes about. And, and I feel that helps to really connect with the listener or the viewer. And that's something that I aim to be more like. You know, or, or Joe Rogan, although he pretends to be a little bit stupid, he's very clever. He, he does listen to a lot of people. He listens to a lot of clever people and he doesn't judge. He's like, oh, wow, I'd never thought of that, you know. And then sometimes you're like, oh, you know what so and so said the other day? So he gives credit for who come up with these ideas or who come up with these quotes. So Joe Rogan is also an inspiration to me. And possibly he could be to you with uh, the, the interesting and colourful language, interesting topics, interesting people. Makes listening so much easier and enjoyable. Anyway, that's my aim. I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there. Right, so British engineers. So you, you may have engineers in your country that, that have a really good reputation, that, that have been around for a long time. Or some really interesting infrastructure, excuse me, like trains and bridges, uh, roadways, architecture, some some interesting monuments and landmarks within your country, within your city, that you think, oh, I wonder who built that. Or you might recognize the name, go, ah, yeah, he's good. He's built a lot of stuff, you know. And that, that kind of gives you a little bit of, a moment of being proud about an engineer or, or, or an architect or somebody that's, that's designed something in your country. And especially if it's old, you know, like if it's been there a hundred years or something, you know, that's real tantamount to the 
prowess and, and the integrity of the, that engineer or that architect that, that really built something quite interesting, quite good. So somebody we like here in the UK is Isambard Kingdom Brunei. Now, that doesn't sound like your average English name. And in fact, even the name Isambard is, is uh, a rare name indeed. And I think Kingdom was his mother's surname. So Isambard Kingdom Bruno. And then his father was also a famous architect and engineer, Brunei, uh, or Brunel, however you pronounce it. And I feel terrible now pronouncing it wrong. Brunel, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. So yeah, we have a lot of things built and engineered by this uh, this incredible gentleman. All right, let's, uh, let's take a bit of a dive. What else we got in? So I've written that like, there was a lot of iconic engineering. So obviously after, um, what would you call it? After the intense farming and things like that, uh, coming into what the 15th, 16th, 17th century, when you got the dawn of the industrial revolution, you know, and, and allegedly that started in the UK as well, where um, a man that had a spinning machine for the textiles industry, or wool and things like that. He had this spinning machine that, that span the yarn. And he was able to make some kind of small little needle thing that, that span. And he was able to thread it through and then made a machine to make it thread backwards and forwards. There is a name for it. I mean, I could Google it and look it up, but it'll be go further off topic. And that apparently is one of the spawns of the Industrial Revolution of becoming more efficient and using less manpower, less man labor uh, and more machinery. Obviously, this has all come in with uh, a lot of other things all coincided at the same time, like steam, um, the, the harnessing and power of the steam uh, and water powering. And, and uh, yeah, a lot of it, I think, a lot of, think of it was um, built upon the Roman the Romans' um, ideology of, of um, engineering, I guess. A lot of things all come together at the same time. So canals, railways, boats, steam engines, all these things, you know, and, and um, yeah, and then, and then putting things into motion, putting these machines into motion, like for the plow, for the steam engine, and then eventually the car, uh, and but but basically the factories got more and more efficient, and so they were able to make a lot of money by having a lot less people, a lot less humans. You know, it's kind of like the dawn of the age of now, where we have maybe the worry of a surplus of a workforce. Maybe they thought that having all this steam power and this uh, this energy and, and this efficiency pushing out the workers maybe i don't know i don't know maybe we weren't the same sort of time now but people people are very flexible and and, and able to diversify and, and and change and move and flow that's the incredible thing about humans and about people we're able to move on and flow and and um, be creative and finding other things right okay so Brunei, 20th century, pivotal role. Uh, yeah, he made the Clifton Suspension Bridge, a Great Western Railway, and uh, a few other things. We, we could dive into that on another day. All right, so statistics show that the um, engineering sector, significant um, input to the economy. In 2019, it was estimated at 1.2 trillion. And that was trillion with a T. I should get a little pop filter. Trillion. I mean, damn, that's a lot of money. 1.2 trillion added to the UK value, gross valid value, employing over 5.8 million people. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? A trillion? Over a trillion? Wow. So you got million, billion, trillion. Whew. Okay, just from engineering, just from engineering. All right. Um, oh, yeah, so they got a lot of prowess in the domains of civil engineering, aerospace, automotive, and manufacturing. Yes. All right. 
other notable achievements in recent years. Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce. Yeah, they were really big. Um, I think I think America now has a, a bigger industry in in regards to engines, especially when it comes to what's the the big companies that make the Airbus and and stuff like that. Hmm. Airbus and Boeing. I think I can't remember the names. There's there's a couple of famous names. Lockhead. I want to say Martin and Lockhead or Martin Lockhead. Anyway, those are also two really big competitors against our Rolls Royce engines. But our Rolls Royce engines uh, really come into their own in, in the Second World War with the Spitfire. I'll come on to that now. So, yeah, the Rolls Royce engines, really, really efficient, quiet and, and used all over the world. Very well, very well liked. Um, infrastructure, Thames Tideway, uh, lots of tunnels. Talk about sustainability and resilient engineering. I think I think one of the key things with engineering is always having more than enough redundancy, inbuilt redundancy. All right. So that means you've got extra large safety margins. You, you know, like like if you built an elevator and you had to have say a maximum of 10 people in that elevator they would engineer it with the cables and and, and all the way it's built to withstand say 20 people twice as much as it needs to all right that inbuilt redundancy that extra safety margins just in case something stupid happened or crazy or or unpredictable happened and that's We'll talk about that later on, but that's how we did a lot of work. The British did a lot of work in regards to earthquakes, uh, stability in buildings. Hmm, that's quite interesting. Right, okay, let's go on, let's go on. Uh, the UK broke records generating over 50% of its electricity, of its, of its electricity from renewable resources in 2020. Uh, it just goes to show how good the, the British engineering is. And then there's some other blah, blah, blah stuff there. Okay. 50%. Do you believe that? Mm, I'm not sure. There seems to be a lot of greenwashing these days. Greenwashing. That's a phrase thrown around to, to imply that somebody who doesn't really care about the environment can exaggerate some figures and exaggerate some of the claims just to make them sound better. So, for example, maybe uh, an energy company, a company that, that um, deals with a lot of electric, may say that, oh, yeah, we, we, help, we help the orangutans in, the, in this, in this um, jungle. Or, oh, yeah, we, we really help with the, the, the water course in the Amazon River in this country, in that country. Where, on the other hand, they're actually probably doing a lot of harm than good. And they just want to have a really good marketing campaign to, to try and make them look good. You know, this halo effect, you know, try and make them sound all amazing and brilliant. But actually, they're, they're destroying the planet in other ways, quietly, by maybe um, lobbying the government, you know, giving the, the government lots of money to be keep quiet about this let let's get this law passed so we can maybe clear another forest or or something like that and and ruin a country from from the quiet underneath we call it backhanders so th this goes on everywhere all the time but i think a lot of countries are getting very good at hiding it so even the uk is has a lot of corruption but it's very very well hidden all right. So you, you can't get a speeding fine and say, oh, sorry, officer, here is ten thousand pounds. Don't tell nobody. You, you could get arrested for that. But. If you were investing in, say, a politician's company or a politician's party or wherever a politician has has money, if you invested in there heavily with some uh, investments and some funds to help out then uh, that's under the table kind of um, 
I've forgotten the word I was going to say now. Under the table kind of uh, corruption. And like I say, in, in the UK and probably America, it is is very hush hush, very secretive, very quiet, and they keep it very well hidden, very well hidden. Even if an investigators try to dig in and find out, those investigators might find themselves in a sticky situation, shall we say? And I, I mean that, you know, even in the UK, there's a lot of dodgy things happening that shouldn't be happening. There's a real lack of transparency. You know, where you can see what's happening and what's going on. Transparency. It's, it's like a lot of magicians and conjuring going on in the uh, in the um, realms of MPs, especially when they're in private member clubs and things like that. All right. It's like a lot of uh, smoke and mirrors, we would say. All right. OK. So engineering. I'm getting distracted again. Sorry, that's me. Engineering. Let's go back to that one. Okay. So who have we got here? We've got we've got quite a few famous people. Uh, some some you might know at the moment. All right. I don't know a lot of these, but the turbojet engine, uh, revolutionising aviation. All right. Sir Frank Whittle. I'd never heard of the guy. 1996, he died. Uh, Sir Barnes Wallace designed the bouncing bomb from the film Dam Busters, helped on a lot of the World War II raids. So apparently one, th there's a lot of things that helped win the war, as they say. But there was there was like the Americans coming in at the end, helping us out. There was the uh, bouncing bomb, which I'm going to talk about now. There was also the encryption of the Enigma machine. Um, and the, the amount of naval ships and the naval, like, game of chess, really, playing playing these games. And everybody coming together, really. It, it was a joint effort of the whole of Europe and America and, you know, some some other allies from different countries. I, I don't want to name everybody because my, my knowledge of history is terrible. Okay. So, the bouncing bomb. It, it was designed to, to take out, I think it was, take out a, a dam. Hence the name of the film, Dam Busters. Right? They busted, broke a dam. And I, I can't for the life of me remember where this dam is. It's, it's just one of them things you forget about. So th this bomb was designed to fall from an aeroplane, hit the water and bounce, 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 and then blow up at the end and destroy the dam, help winning another part of the war. Anyway, so that, that's the, the long story short. And I apologise if there's any important details that you know offend anybody or miss out anybody. Right, so the dam bouncing bomb. Right. Sir Alex Isinians. I can't even say that. So he, he designed the Mini Cooper. The Mini Cooper car. That was super popular in the UK. Um, it sold loads of them. It was really good. It, it like made, basically made a really, really small car for the family to get in. And it had, well, they say back then it had good handling and steering. But no, it was just very, very cheap. Very cheap. Um, and and can, compared to modern day standards, it's an awful thing to drive. But it's a lot of fun. It's, it's like a go-kart. Now, a go-kart is what we call um, a seat with a go and stop pedal uh, and four wheels and a steering wheel on a little frame. And often we'd go to maybe... Um, a carnival or, or, or some sort of uh, adventure play area and there would be these go-karts racing around. It's a way that adults and, and older children can have a fun racing around on a track that's very safe, you know. And that's apparently where a lot of Formula One drivers start, you know, like um, Lewis Hamilton started with go-karts, you know. You're very young and you can play driving. It's, it's a lot of fun. Right. So the Mini Cooper, like I said, Mini Cooper, a revolutionary compact car, very fuel efficient. OK, now what about James Dyson? Some of you might know James Dyson. Uh, obviously, there's the Dyson vacuum cleaner, the fan, bladeless fan. You know, like in, in some modern places, you, you put your hands in and you go to the toilet in the back and, and then you come out of the toilet and you wash your hands. And then you have this thing called like um, a blade an air blade so it's just 
hot air, I suppose. And you put your hands down and bring them back up and it sort of blows all the air off your and water off your hands. Very, very much like a car wash, really. If you go in a car wash, after the whole washing thing, you have this, this thing that goes up and down over the contour of your car and it's supposed to blow the water off to minimise streaks. Anyway, this is very, very similar to that. So James Dyson, he was also looking into electric cars at one point, but um, I think they've I think they've shelved that now. Shelved that is a phrase we use to to imply no longer interested in, no longer working on. They just put it to one side for now. Okay, what else did they do? Um, a washing machine. They made a washing machine. But, but the most famous is the Dyson vacuum cleaner. Dyson vacuum cleaner. Okay, who else we got? Sir Bernard Crossland, uh, pioneering the field of structural engineering and the use of computer design. I'm, I'm guessing that's CAD design, C-A-D, computer aided design, CAD. Very, very, well, it's virtually used in all engineering now with the, uh, with, with the advent of computers being able to design everything, be more efficient, quicker, and, and able to run simulations and things like that to, to uh, minimize a lot of the, um, a lot of the, I don't know, wastage, I guess, uh, and save a lot of time. All right, okay. Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin developed the X-ray and, and other techniques around that. Oh, okay. Nobel Prize in chemistry. Sir Christopher Crockwell invented the hovercraft. You guys have all seen a hovercraft. You know, the thing that, that floats on the water and it can go on the land as well. Just big, big fans underneath lifting it up. That's interesting. Uh, Sir Clive Sinclair, the ZX Spectrum. I think he also did a lot in the way of um, calculators. That's it. Not Casio, but Spectrum Sinclair Calculator. I think that's the guy. And the ZX Spectrum was a really um, early days pioneering computer, like the BBC Acorn and some of those uh, really early, early um, personal computers. But I think this one, Sir Clive Sinclair, sold his... Uh, calculator business to Sir Alan Sugar. That's another famous person in the UK, a big businessman. I think he's definitely a multi-millionaire. I'm, I'm not sure if he's a billionaire. Uh, Sir Richard Arkwright. <laughs> Arkwright, that's a funny name. Okay, textiles industry, significant increases in efficiency of cotton spinning. Yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier, cotton spinning. And then Frederick Lancaster, he made the uh, helped develop the all British petrol driven car, the Lancaster. There was also an aeroplane called the Lancaster Bomber. But that's another thing. Um, and that kind of pushes more into and um, not just engineering, but invention. So there's a lot of invention and, and um, engineering. Oh, and just as a fun fact, Concorde was a, a really big, famous plane in the 80s and 90s. Uh, I I think it went like twice the speed of sound. It was like the first, the first supersonic um, airplane that you could go on and as just open to the public, as just a regular person. It was very expensive, mostly full of celebrities and film stars and important influential people. And that was developed and built with the French. So yeah, the French have got a really, really strong foundation of engineering. The French are very good at engineering. Uh, as well as the Channel Tunnel, you can see there. The Channel Tunnel, that was built with the French. So we've got a lot of respect for the French. They've got a lot of great engineering. A lot of great minds in, in France. Um, engineering is uh, in the DNA. So like it says the DNA, it's because a lot of British people are, are, are happy to build things and fabricate things in their sheds and in their garages. Very inspired people from engineering, really enjoy engineering. Um, and lots and lots and lots more. But as I've written here, um, engineering now is generally superseded by German engineering. Um, they seem to have, I think they have 
or they did have different labor laws. They were able to get materials cheaper being being um, uh, in Europe and, and not having to, to get it across to the island where, where we're obviously an island. Um, and and their engineering and their, their their commitment and focus to engineering, I think, superseded English as well as a few problems we had with with um, trade unions back in the 70s and 80s and, and our MP, Margaret Thatcher, closing down the mines and really shaking up our our industries there of, of steel, iron, steel, mining and um, yeah, and engineering. That was a, a lot of uh, a big shake up and a big change for us. And like I said, then I think Germany superseded that again. Um, and maybe in the future, maybe China will. But currently, Chinese is not known for its quality of products more uh, unless it's plastic and electronics, but not so much in the in engineering of, of um, what's the word architecture and infrastructure and civil engineering. That's the word I was thinking of civil engineering. Oh, if you don't know, civil engineering kind of means engineering for roads and towns you know the big stuff like like sewage and and bridges and and things like that and roads civil engineering yeah so we've been on quite the decline for for uh, a number of decades now with uh, our engineering reputation which is a bit of a shame bit of a shame but there you go what can you do about these things what can you do so engineering closely linked with inventions as well. Uh, there's a one famous invention that you might not be aware of, but is apparently from from Tim Berners-Lee. You get a moment, look him, look him up on Google. Tim Berners-Lee. Now, he is said to be the father of the internet. He was one of the first people to uh, help write the code and set up the code and sending things back and forth to other universities um yeah sir Tur sir tim berners lee right okay so yeah what else we got um i i got more inventions here really like the toothbrush 1780 christmas cracker desalination and stengeraf what's that stengeraf hiding a secret code Stengeraf, ah, Francis Bacon. So yeah, these are a lot more inventions that I've got here, notes that, that I looked at earlier. The guillotine was actually um, from the UK. The light bulb, Sir Joseph Swan. Um, telephone, Sir Alexander Graham Bell was English. Um, uh, and then he went to Canad Canada. Uh, when he was a young man, when he was 23, he went to Canada. But he was actually English. Who else we got here? The submarine in the 1600s. Wow. Redesigned in 1578. Photography, 1802. Apparently, again, come from the UK. Steam locomotive, Richard Trevithick, 1802. And George Stevenson. Now, I remember from school a lot about George Stevenson, 1825. Um, what have we got? Computer programmer Adela Lovelace, Ada Lovelace, sorry, world's first computer programmer. Wow, the sewage systems, Joseph Bag Basileghetto, 1865, vaccines, 1796. I've said about the Concorde and the tunnel and Tim Berners Lee, yeah, so oh, and radio. Where was that one? Radio. David Edward Hughes, Welshman, uh, 1856, The Telegraph. Right, so yes, the UK, not just lots and lots of amazing engineers, but also some really good inventions as well. I got another whole page on inventions. I, I won't bore with you that now. But inventions, like I said, with, with the... With the love affair, England has a love affair, or the UK has a love affair with sheds and garages and building and making and constructing things in our garages and sheds. Kind of spawned the beginning of Dragon's Den and, and, and programs like that because people make stuff at home 
often in their sheds and garages, things that that are really frustrating and irritating to other people. You know, that, that necessity. Mother is the invention. Necessity is the mother of invention. That's the famous quote. Please don't ask me who wrote it. Mother. Necessity is the mother of invention. So something that is necessary, you end up building and making something to make your life easier. All right. So that's about it now. I'm going to wrap that up. Hopefully, hopefully the microphone come out well and the camera looks good. You have to let me know down in the comments. So if you're passionate or excited about learning and speaking English, stay tuned. We've got a lot more interesting content to come out for you, a lot more interesting conversations. And if you're excited or passionate about somebody from your country that has built something, then, then let me know in the comments. Let's have this conversation going. Somebody has built something. All right, that's it for now. Take care and I'll see you next time. Have a good week. Bye-bye.